In 1900, when these films were made along New York's Fifth Avenue, two newly born inventions were just beginning to shape and expand our lives. The automobile and the motion picture. We are traveling up turn of the century Broadway, a street already world famous for its swank restaurants, legitimate theaters, and electric lights. The first movie houses were not to be found here, but on the side streets. The lowly Nickelodeon catered to the common man, and from the beginning, comedy was king. As one showman pointed out, you can get an onion to make you cry, but nobody has discovered a vegetable to make you laugh. Films had to be hand-cranked by the weary projectionist. In this early French comedy, someone steals into the Paris Conservatory and makes the great master clock run fast, which speeds up time everywhere in the city. What a difference two decades made. This is Fifth Avenue in the 1920s. The automobile had driven the horse from the streets to the racetrack. And this is Broadway and evolution through the roaring 20s, as it might have been viewed if we were riding H.G. Wells' time machine. It's 1920. Marion Davies is playing at the Globe. Stage attractions still dominate the Great White Way, like Cinderella on Broadway at the Winter Garden. 1921, Midnight Photo Plays, and Chalmers Underwear. 1923, the cast of the Ziegfeld Follies includes Fanny Bryce, Bert Wheeler, and Paul Whiteman. In 1924, Broadway offers on stage the Marx Brothers, Fred Astaire, and Will Rogers. 1925, on screen, Lon Chaney is in The Phantom of the Opera. In 1926, Mae West makes headlines when her show is closed and she is sentenced to jail. The moving sign above the Capitol Theater in the distance proclaims Eric von Stroheim's production, The Merry Widow, starring Mae Murray and John Gilbert. At the Astor, the big parade is in its second year. As 1926 ends, Beau Gest, starring Ronald Coleman, is at the Criterion. In 1927, the Criterion features Old Ironsides with Wallace Beery and Charles Farrell. Also in 1927, signs for the student prince and for Cecil B. DeMille's King of Kings light up the Broadway sky. 1928, White Shadows in the South Seas, Lost in the Arctic, 
and a contest to find new kids for our gang comedies. 1929. Silent films and the prosperous 20s bow out together. The lights of Broadway take on a special glow before the Depression dims them and World War II blacks them out. The sign for the part talky Noah's Ark combines electric bulbs and clouds of steam in a display stretching almost a block. Movie theaters had progressed from shabby Nickelodeon to Shining Palace. The old hand crank projectionist was only a memory. Through these early movie years, Oliver Hardy, first of our four clowns, played a part in the growth of silent comedy from rough beginnings to what many today consider a lost art. Here he supports Billy West, whose impersonation of Charlie Chaplin was so exact it was uncanny. The girl is Leatrice Joy. Enter a sissy. He's Billy Quirk, a film comedy pioneer, once leading man to Mary Pickford. and invites her to the barber's ball, where trouble develops at once, and Billy West proves that when his body's in action, it's almost impossible to tell him apart from Charlie Chaplin's little tramp. The police arrive. They're looking for a bay rum addict with a mustache. In the hobo, Charlie, I mean Billy, has just collected a big reward. It looks like he's also won the girl from young Oliver Hardy, here minus mustache. As every moviegoer of 1917 expected, the romantic tables are turned so that Billy can give us a typical Charlie Chaplin pathos ending. Ten years later in No Man's Law, an offbeat Hal Roach Western of 1927, Oliver Hardy plays the grubby villain, Sharky Nye. The girl he's leering at is lovely Barbara Kent. The other prong of this triangle is the girl's guardian stallion, Rex the Wonder Horse. Running through the woods, Barbara Kent will remind some moviegoers of Hedy Lamarr in Ecstasy, made a decade after this. But don't be concerned, Barbara is wearing a flesh-colored bathing suit. This is still a family picture.
orders Rex to let Hardy alone. She shouldn't have. After a few kicks for good measure, the sensitive stallion retires to the upper ridges, leaving unprotected our waif of the wasteland. wants to play house. Rex is determined there'll be no house left to play in. This kind of thing could be hard on a villain's nerves. Hardy retreats. Rex forecloses the mortgage. of our four clowns is Stan Laurel. Before teaming with Oliver Hardy and perfecting the character of Oliver's beloved dim-witted friend, Stan often played brash go-getters like this patent medicine salesman and bird impersonator. nearby, Happy Harry, yesterday's playboy in need of refreshment. Watch those elevator shoes. <laughs> Harry is beset by a government agent in this bygone age of prohibition. Discovers he has visitors in the carpet. It's worse than mice or moths. It's tunneling convict Oliver Hardy. And his burrowing cellmate, Stan Laurel. This Hal Roach comedy, The Second Hundred Years, was the first official Laurel and Hardy release. Thank you.
Masterful Oliver Hardy, signs mean nothing. He demonstrates that to be a successful Christmas tree salesman in sunny California, you have to be both persistent and hard-headed. Mistaken for visiting royalty, Laurel and Hardy register in style. Actually, Stanley and Oliver, who were always starting new jobs, are reporting as doormen from the bottom of the labor barrel. reduced to their proper station, Stan and Ollie become involved in a monetary crisis. Oliver Hardy versus the law. getting skittish Scotch nephew Stanley fitted for a pair of pants. Really? vows he'll get those measurements no matter what the consequences.
betrayed. Neither will Thelma and Ruby. Demure damsels in distress always bring out the devil-may-care romantic side of Stanley and Oliver. Stanley. Put them in here. Enter shopkeeper Charlie Hall, Laurel and Hardy's eternal opponent. Cleaning things up, explains Oliver. <laughs> Thelma commands, go help your shipmate.
This 1928 Pal Roach comedy, Their Purple Moment, was dedicated to husbands who hold out part of their pay envelope on their wives and live to tell about it. Stanley hides his loot in a portrait of Uncle Sneed, a natural place to store money. Because he couldn't take it with him, Uncle Sneed wouldn't go. <coughs> Guests arrive, friend Oliver and Mrs. Hardy. Mrs. Laurel replaces Stan's money with cigar coupons, the trading stamps of their day. Hardy's wife is a bloodhound. The most money he gets to keep is five cents car fare, and he has to show the transfer. But Laurel explains he's a weasel with a hiding place even a wife couldn't find. Oliver, the financial advisor, has one-way pockets marked out. Naturally, he knows just the way to spend Stanley's savings. The town gossip. Fine day for mischief, observes Mrs. Fisheye. Let's go, says Oliver. guys who couldn't pay the bill are expelled from Eden, the cafe Eden, that is. They're followed by the girlfriends they left with a check, Kay DeLise and Anita Garvin, a pair of roving debutantes. solves it all. They'll assume responsibility. The age of chivalry lives on, down to the last dollar Stanley thinks he has. coupons.
put it on the check, says Stanley. A taxi driver joins the party. The girls, who believe in instant transportation, left him outside with a clock running. In 1928, there wasn't a man living who could lift the stuff you could buy with the amount on that meter. Sit down, have a steak, says good time Oliver. suggests a fast exit, the tippy-toe route. this number's over, requests Hardy. From a nightmare to grim reality, from a skirmish to Armageddon, here come the wise. The head waiter, played by Tiny Sanford, is back. This time he'll either see green or red. moment of crisis, Oliver announces he has an idea. <laughs> Tell them your idea, Ollie, says Stanley. We were heading for the bowling alley, explains Oliver, when Stanley dragged me to this den of vice. No one has replaced Laurel and Hardy just as no one has replaced Chaplin or Keaton or Fields. Good comedians have many imitators. The great clowns stand alone. Wow, wow, wow. 
is Charlie Chase, the original good time Charlie whose elk's tooth had a cavity. Lindbergh had just flown the Atlantic. Lucky Lindy referred to himself and his plane as we, and the term became a household word. So Charlie made a comedy called Us, in which he tried to get up courage to take his first flight. says the little old lady. It's great. Tomorrow I'll try wing walking. says mother, flying soothes her better than her cradle. Granddad, it sure beats Goatland. Charlie cries, nothing can stop me this time. Made in 1927, this film is a memento of a time not so long ago when dusty cow pastures were transformed into airports. Planes were made of piano wire, canvas, and plywood. And a five-minute flight was one of life's great adventures. Refunds, yells the one-man ground crew. Get in there and fly. We've got customers waiting for that coat. Another daring rescue ruined by lack of danger. The girl he thought he saved is an aviatrix, and Charlie is going up at last.
Charlie Chase's life was one long, embarrassing moment. Goopy, to take off on the title of the then current stage hit, What Price Glory, Charlie has been asked to put up a certain Professor Boggs as house guest. He has no idea Professor Boggs is a beautiful woman with May Murray type bee stung lips. Another visitor, Noah Young, a burglar so busy his crowbar is suffering from mental fatigue. Butler Lucian Littlefield announces the professors in the guest room upstairs. Unsuspecting Charlie, who thinks all professors are old fogies, decides it's time to dress for dinner. En route home, Charlie's wife. Mrs. Chase arrives. Her sunny disposition resembles that of a hyena with a sore nose. Charlie admits the little woman. While she's accusing him of stepping out, Noah's stepping in. Chase calls the professor to dinner. In his Cal Roach comedies, poor Charlie was always innocent, but he got caught anyway. Buddy the Terrier is such a bad watchdog, he won't even watch. Hungry for culture, Noah stole a cap and gown before tackling the silverware. The professor misinterprets Charlie's pleading for silence as some kind of attack. just taken out the laundry. <laughs> In fluttering hearts, Charlie Chase makes a clothes store dummy come alive. Oliver Hardy is the tipsy victim who couldn't and shouldn't believe his eyes.
bugs are bad this year, observes Oliver. <laughs> On movie night, Charlie's daughter, played by Edith Fellows, comes down with the hiccups. Old medicine man Charlie attempts to scare them away. Who? <laughs> That means no movie tonight. The cure is instantaneous. More hiccups. Charlie, the good Samaritan, decides he'll use the same scare technique to cure the cashier, too. In family group, Charlie, wife, and baby pose for a portrait. Charlie's pea-shooting son is on the window seat. The photographer is Edgar Kennedy. Without a balloon in the picture, Edgar's camera won't work. Nothing could stop Charlie Chase in his everlasting journey from bad to worse. He buys all the balloons just in time for a California windstorm. holding him up, wonders Gertrude Astor as Charlie's wife. Look! Goodness, moans Mrs. Chase. This never would have happened if he'd eaten a heavy breakfast.
Viola Richards' car runs wild in limousine love, a Charlie Chase misadventure in depth. Viola's unhurt, but her flaming youth got all damp. She spots an empty limousine. Cars of the 20s with shades and cut glass vases made perfect dressing rooms. In today's models, you'd have a hard time dressing a midget. Meanwhile, Charlie, the limousine's owner, discovers gas trucks don't sell retail. There's adventure minus dressing ahead for Charlie, a bridegroom-to-be already late for his wedding. Charlie discovers he had gasoline all the time. Remember when cars carried spare gas on their running boards? Remember when cars had running boards? There go Viola's clothes. Every stitch. Viola through the speaker. Quick, catch my clothing. Out the window. I'll explain later. church, a naked woman in the car, and along hobbles Edgar Kennedy, the most persistent hitchhiker west of Upper Sandusky. You can have a lift, says Charlie, but not in the back seat. Not in the back seat. Charlie explains about his cargo in the rear, and Edgar smiles knowingly. He belongs to that great fraternity of men who have been around a bit themselves. Up roars a cop, looking for contraband booze, flooding the land in these days of prohibition. Charlie has the guilty look of someone hauling bathtub gin. Pull over, orders the policeman. The presence of an arm of authority quickly transforms experienced Edgar from passenger to innocent bystander. Okay, brother, let's see what's inside, commands the law. No, no, pleads poor Charlie. Yes, yes, says the cop. It's all right, chum. I'm only looking for rum runners. Bootleggers, they were everywhere. Edgar suggests they circle his hotel and he'll pick up some clothing. But wouldn't you know it, Edgar's Hotel is just the place they're holding Charlie's wedding. (laughs) 
I can't stop the car, yells Charlie. It's the pickup. The best man volunteers. I'll stop it. Charlie has to share his secret. The males of the 20s were not as yet fully domesticated. They stuck together. We can't stop. There's something wrong with her body. Her motor's racing. She needs to be greased. The case is hopeless. It's the naked truth. That's enough of that, says the father of the bride. I'll stop it. Now Charlie has to tell all to dear old dad. It happens to the best of us, says father. You should have seen what used to go on in my Stanley steamer. There's no stopping her now. She's stripped. When at 30, something's gumming up her wedding, never underestimate the power of a woman. The determined to be bride kills the switch. My, my, says Charlie. Now, why didn't we think of that? One, two, hop. on here, asked the bride. Oh, uh, this is our lodge ceremony, explains quick-thinking Charlie. Mother, don't tell me you'd marry that leaping bedsheet. Wedding goes Charlie Chase, man of the roaring twenties, a simpler, happier, and long vanished moment of time. Our fourth clown is Buster Keaton. He and friend J. Roy Barnes learn from lawyer Snitz Edwards that Buster is to inherit seven million dollars. 
providing he is married by 7 p.m. on his 21st birthday. And when is his 21st birthday? That very day. The long arm of coincidence often stretched out of its socket in this era of movie making when fun was more important than logic. He's off to propose to Genevieve, his sweetheart since childhood. Genevieve is thrilled at first, but then he lets slip that business about seven o'clock and seven million dollars, and the climate changes. She's afraid he wants to marry her for his money. Rejected by the girl he loves, poor Buster decides it doesn't matter whom he marries. He'll marry anyone who'll have him, even a golfette, as long as it's before seven o'clock. by friend and lawyer, Buster proposes on. By mother, Buster's girl writes him a note. Translated from female into English, it reads, yes. Mary doesn't trust the phone. Anyway, in those days, proper girls didn't call boys. It wasn't ladylike. 
So she sends her message by Pony Express. J. Roy Barnes has an idea. I'll get a bride, he says. Meet me at the Broad Street Church at five. Acceptance at last. Is this movie over? Too early. Even if you play grown up in my makeup and coat, says Mother, you're still only 12. Proposal, wheel to wheel. <laughs> Barnes' big idea. Give the story to the newspaper. I've done it. That should flush out a bride or two. This comedy, Seven Chances, was made in 1925. Almost a half century later, Niagara Falls and Reno still signify the ins and outs of marriage. Thank <laughs> you.
Minister speaks. Ladies, may I please have your attention? You're evidently the victims of some practical joker. I must ask you to leave the church as quickly and as quietly as possible. the message. Genevieve is his. Nothing stands between our hero and happiness but time, space, and an unmarried mob.
Keaton loses his watch. With that seven o'clock deadline looming ever nearer, he has to know the time. Life of somebody's party awakens to the morning after. Forty five minutes left. to Genevieve's house. I'll get there before seven if I can. This film was directed, apparently at full gallop, by Buster Keaton himself.
directs the lead Amazon, I know a shortcut. We'll head him off at the pass.
married in the nick of time. Eternal happiness, love, wealth, no worries, except keeping out of the way of a few thousand disappointed brides. pick out 18-year-old Jean Harlow? She was the woman who lost her dress in Laurel and Hardy's Double Whoopee. She continued to play small roles in short features for two more years before Howard Hughes cast her in Hell's Angels. And finally, who was this guy, Charlie Chase? Well, he was a very talented fellow from Baltimore, Maryland. He starred in, produced, wrote, or directed an amazing 155 films for Hal Roach Studios, most of which were shorts. And he also appeared with many of the top comedy stars of the day, including Charlie Chaplin and Laurel Hardy, of course. In the late 30s, he directed some of the early Three Stooges pictures. But success didn't make Charlie Chase very happy. He was always a very heavy drinker, and he had an unhappy marriage, and that made it a lot worse. And he was just 46 years old when he died of a heart attack. Now, I come from Baltimore, and he was one of our very big stars. We were very proud of him. He was a very talented man, and his name is remembered by movie buffs around the world. Now watch this. <laughs> 